Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Debbie Way Mullen of Copper Cow Coffee coming to us from Los Angeles. How are you doing, Debbie? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, how many cups of coffee of your product have you had today? I have had one. I try to I try to limit it to one. Sometimes I feel a little, a little bit like a drug dealer and I have to, you know, not get too addicted to my to my stash, you know. <laughs> um, all right. So speaking of your stash, what is it you guys do? What is Copper Cow? Um, so Copper Cow Coffee, we're a specialty Vietnamese coffee company, and we try to make specialty Vietnamese and Asian beverage experiences really easy for you to enjoy anywhere. Um, our most popular seller is a pour-over Vietnamese coffee, so we manufacture a little filter that can fit over any cup, so you can make a fresh pour-over, as well as single servings of dairy and non-dairy uh, creamer that make it a, a true Vietnamese authentic coffee. And I uh, started the business about two years ago and launched in a lot of retailers and really kind of got inspired to do it because my mom's from Vietnam and just never understood why Vietnamese food is not more widely available and known about. And, you know, each time I've ever introduced anyone to it, they've been in love with Vietnamese coffee. It's so unique. It's so delicious. And... I really thought that if I could create like an elevated, more accessible version of it, that people would be excited about it. And so far it seems like it's true. That's great. And so uh, I love Vietnamese coffee, although it's interesting. I love it, but I don't drink it unless I'm at a Vietnamese restaurant. I did, when I went to Vietnam years ago, I brought home the little silver cup, you know, that yeah. sits on top. I brought one of those home and I bought, some some coffee with me and probably made it a few times and then didn't do it but it's it yeah it's it's a great coffee how's the reaction going what's the it's it's good so we've we launched the company two years ago started shipping product about 18 months ago and we're in about three thousand retailers right now and by the end of this year we'll probably be in about five thousand retailers um, but what we're most excited about um, and what we raised money for is uh, to really promote our marketing strategy and to um, support a subscription-based direct-to-consumer business that is really perfect for our model of coffee. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's very popular these days. W- retailers meaning small supermarkets, national supermarkets. What's your distribution strategy been? Um, so we, you know, I'm really passionate about making it accessible. So we have taken on all types of retailers. We definitely started off really high end, um, in a lot of specialty boutiques and grocery stores, and then also in William Sonoma and cost plus were our first national accounts, but now we're in Walmart and we are also in other bigger grocery chains like HEB is a really great account for us. And we are going to be probably entering about 2,000 more doors this year of other, of other large retailers. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And the form factor, maybe describe it. I looked on the website. It looks pretty cool. It's kind of a, how do you, how do you describe it? It's like this almost a pouch that sits on top of the cup. Is that? Yeah. So it's, it's a pre, it's a, it's a pouch that's pre-filled with the organic coffee and then it has little wings. So you just open up the wings and it kind of rests on top of your cup and then you can tear off the top so it becomes this open pour over that you can pour hot water into and have a a really beautiful cup of coffee with not having to invest in any equipment, not having to worry about, you know, and also it's biodegradable. So it's definitely less plastic than other single use coffees out there. And is that pouch with wings, you probably have a name for it, but is that something you guys invented or is that a a product that's already out there? Um, It's something that we have iterated on, but it is a product that is very popular in Japan. Oh, interesting. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks neat. Uh, And just to get into the weeds a little bit, is Vietnamese coffee 
for anyone not familiar with it, is it Arabica beans roasted in a certain way or is it the condensed sweetened milk that makes it Vietnamese coffee or, or what makes Vietnamese coffee Vietnamese coffee? I think that's open to interpretation. Um, for us, it means, you know, coffee that was grown in Vietnam and there's many varietals, um, Arabica as well as Robusta. And then from what, and then basically there are things that are typically done traditionally, such as the way it's roasted. It's usually a dark roast. Um, and there are things that we do and don't do that are traditional. Um, oftentimes it's roasted with additional flavors and we don't do that because we really want the, the coffee itself to shine because we, we put a lot of effort into the coffee sourcing that we do. Um, Vietnam's actually the second largest coffee producer in the world. Mm. It's just that it's normally distributed throughout Asia. Um, and so it's got a really unique like nutty mocha undertone compared to some of the other regions of coffee. And then it is traditionally served with sweetened condensed milk. Um, though I drink it black every day. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, awesome. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you kind of hinted at this. I was, of course, curious, like, you know, is this a venture type of deal? I think coffee companies probably usually aren't, but I think maybe you hinted at it with the subscription services uh, model. Maybe talk about raising money. When did you decide to go raise money? Actually, go back to your beginning days. Did you bootstrap this for a while? Did you, you know, how'd you fund this thing? Um, so actually, I first started off um, self-funding a, a oil and vinegar line for you to make Vietnamese food at home yeah. and uh, just was doing it on the side, uh, thinking that I wanted to start my own company and had a lot of different business ideas. And this was one that I could just kind of do while I was still working full time at the World Bank and uh, immediately got into a lot of stores and felt like I had a lot of validation around the type of product I was making in terms of it being elevated in terms of the branding that I, that I did and in terms of it being a Vietnamese product. But I definitely realized that the market of people who want to buy products to cook is actually quite small. Only 10% of Americans cook. So it was a, a big learning with that. And it's funny that you say that uh, about coffee being venture backable. It's actually quite venture backable. Um, coffee, coffee companies exit all the time for $300 million. Um, it's just that you don't, That's coffee true. companies that you probably not even never heard of. Um, and so, I mean, obviously there's the recent acquisition of Blue Bottle by Nestle for 700 plus million, but there's yep. actually a lot of out there because um, it is such a huge market. You know, 70% of Americans drink coffee every day, multiple times a day. 60% of those drink their coffee with milk and sugar every day, you know, so there's, there's really a, mar a large market. Um, and I thought that this would be such a fun differentiation because um, Vietnamese coffee was always something that I wanted to elevate. And when I started to really think about, okay, what's something venture backable? Cause I wanted a real supply chain focused business using my learnings from my old career at the world bank and realized that, you know, I, it would be so hard to grow a cooking line compared to growing a coffee line. And so I, I then raised um, friends and family and angel money to, mm -hmm. to launch the coffee line. So up until the point of I bootstrapped the, the first line myself. And then when I was like, okay, this is something that's going to really be venture backable was when I went and pitched it to all of my friends and family, anybody that I knew that might have some cash. I basically asked if they were interested in investing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, you're right. Right after I said that, I started to think about Blue Bottle and some others that, uh, especially some of these real trendy kind of third wave of coffee businesses. And I'm like, yeah, that's that was venture funded. That was venture funded. So yeah, I retract that statement. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I mean, that's the thing is that you. It's how would you know? You know that uh, that uh, what what types of food are venture backable and what what aren't? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very cool. So what was the, what was the hardest part about this? Is it sourcing coffee from Vietnam and the whole supply chain of, you know, product or, or more distribution? Sounds like you've done a pretty good job in getting distribution. What's the, what's been the challenge? Um, it, that's a good question. Cause I think that the, it's equal parts. What's, what's difficult and what do you not like to do <laughs> yeah. when you're a solo you have to do everything so you know you could argue that the supply chain part is the hardest part you know we, we source every ingredient ourselves we're really hands-on with it but that's my passion like I can't imagine 
not being focused on that. So I think it, it's easy for me to direct time to that versus, you know, for me, um, having cohesive marketing strategies, things like that were kind of new for me and were really challenging. You know, how, how do you get your first pieces of press and also in cash flow? I mean, you're, you're trying to build streams of payments in stores or through customers who are going to repeat on your website and you have to pay for a lot of stuff to set that, set those things up. And, um, I think I, I, it was a, it was a lot of learning for me for how much money it takes to launch a company, even when you feel like you are bootstrapping as tightly as possible. Mm -hmm. What, if you're willing to share, what breakdown of your business is through retailers versus the subscription? Cause I'm assuming the profit margin is a lot higher on the subscription, right? So you probably want to focus on um, that. It's about the same on the subscription, actually, for the margin, only because we pass on the savings to the subscribers. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we love we love being able to really engage um, the subscribers, and we know that having all the data and direct connection to the customers will really fuel and inform product development that can inform, mm -hmm. you know, retail. So, for instance, you know, we're we're expanding the product line to a couple new products, and we chose those products by. Um, seeing how they performed on e-com before we try to sell them into retail, you know, and it's, it's really easy um, to have that. So we, but we have, um, it's about at this point, it, last year we were primarily retail and now we're about 50-50. Interesting. Does that make it harder to do the retail deals if the retailer can Google you guys and find that the product is available cheaper direct? Like, does that hard to... Well, them. it's 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 cheap. It's cheaper per unit direct, but yeah. it's not cheaper in terms of because you have to spend thirty five dollars a month for the subscription versus you can spend ten dollars in a store to try yeah. it. So we have the product optimized for retail in retailers. Then we have the product optimized. So if you are a true copper cow lover, buying from the website is going to make a lot of sense if you are, if this is going to be your, your coffee solution versus if you're just curious and trying it or you're buying it for the weekend or uh, it, it's, it's definitely optimized for the retailer. So the retailer actually has an advantage because they can sell it for $10 and someone can decide to, to try it versus someone has to kind of commit to more when they buy it from us. So it's going to be two different customers actually. Yeah, it makes sense. And I guess, would restaurants be a channel? I know we're going to get the funding in a minute. I'm kind of going off on these tangents. But is a restaurants a channel or Vietnamese restaurants are making their own Vietnamese coffee, not so much a, a channel? Yeah, I would say that. If, so and this is, a, this is the battle that and one of the reasons why I wanted to start this company was that, you know, a lot of the people who own um, the Vietnamese restaurants that I grew up loving are really sensitive to price. And people think of Vietnamese food as an inexpensive cuisine and so they're going to be really shocked when i tell them that the coffee is going to cost four times as much as <laughs> they're the one that they've that they've been serving that's full of chemicals honestly um but you know so it's a little bit hard for that old guard i think it's more um, we do have some restaurants who carry us in, that are very new and, and forward thinking that are kind of more um, fusion i would say but uh we find that things like hotels and offices are a much better channel for us than restaurants right now just because i think that this is considered a branded luxury portable coffee experience that that um is more compatible with that right now yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've never quite understood how you can get a, uh, is it a bun mi, the sandwich, Vietnamese sandwich for like $3.85 or, I you know. know. <laughs> I mean, we're good supply chain people, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's hard for it to say, well, well, now you should charge, you know, double or triple for your coffee, you know, they're, they're a little bit, they get, they definitely get the sticker shock right now. Yeah. It's interesting. Okay, so let's go back to fundraising. We started down that path and I got distracted. Um, so friends and family, Angel, and then when did you decide to say, hey, we're going to make this a scalable startup and get out there and uh, raise from Z VCs? Maybe take me through that journey. Sure. So we, we saw, even though we were growing the fastest in retailers, just because, you know, we launched and within a month we had gotten into a thousand stores. We were pretty overwhelmed by the retail demand since we were bootstrapped. I did see the most growth online 
um, especially towards the end of our first year and knew that I wanted to kind of switch to that mode, especially if we were going to look for venture funding. So I actually did the 500 startups program. Okay. And I did that um, at the beginning of 2018. And I think it was really helpful for a number of reasons. One is that it helped brand us as not just a coffee company. It, it really showed people that we wanted to be a tech company and that was how we were going to grow and how we were going to win. And it also uh, just helped prepare me to understand what it was going to be like to raise venture. You know, it's definitely not necessary, but it was a great tool for me to have as a resource when I was be when I began to want to to fundraise. So you know, up throughout both 2000 end of 2017 through 2018, I, I was I wanted to raise venture, and I was having you know informal meetings with VCs to have them to gauge their interest in you know, one of the biggest feedbacks I would get or, or reasons why they said they would say that they didn't know if it was a good fit was that they would call the product niche. They would say, well, is Vietnamese coffee really mainstream? You know, and it was, it was hard when I was saying, well, taste it. It's not, it's not a niche product. It's a delicious coffee. It just so happens to be Vietnamese, just like you just so happen to drink Ethiopian or Nicaraguan. This is going to be, you know, a really unique, but totally mainstream product and people were just a little bit hesitant of, of that and so for us getting into walmart you know walmart called us we didn't reach out to walmart for them to call us and to be interested in carrying us and for it's to be in walmart in your second year of business is really really unique and it really stopped any conversation or any naysayer who said this wasn't mainstream because not only are we in Walmart, but we're, we're selling very well. And so it's, it, it was a really, really important moment for us to demonstrate the power of our supply chain that we could ramp up to something of that level the way that we did. And as well as show that mass mass America is, is actually asking for this. It's not even um, us pushing it to them. Right. Is there a, like an analogous company? I'm almost thinking like a Thai iced, Thai iced tea company, or I guess you see the green tea, you know, which probably has some big home runs. But is there like an analogous company that sort of started as this sort of niche drink and became mainstream that you can point to or, or, or not so much? Not, not in terms of this, this specific, like as specific as a Asian beverage, you know, um, like this, uh, the one example I would like that I, that I kind of find as an inspiration is, is Dang Chips. You know, they had these coconut chips and these uh, kind of Asian inspired chips that really honed in on some other trends going on. So in addition to it being this elevated um, type of Asian snack, it also was really good for paleo and it was good for people who were doing plant-based diets and to see that while, and we're doing the same thing, we're taking an elevated Asian product and we're building on the trends of pour over and of people wanting oh, yeah. clean ingredients and in their in their indulgences and so i think this is that's something that i took took a lot of inspiration from but you know isn't necessarily something that you could say would be a, a true equivalent how did all right I, I promised to get back to fundraising but there's so many other interesting things i just want to ask how did you get in a thousand stores in a month and how did you get the attention of walmart where they're calling you like are you a pr machine like what was the you know that's all <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that, you know, I, I would be lying if I said that there isn't some luck. I think any entrepreneur knows that luck is a, a big part of it, you know, but what, what really stands the test is if you're ready to take on that luck and, and, you know, really move with it. And for us, we went, we, dem we, de we debuted at the Fancy Food Show, which is one of the biggest food and beverage trade shows in the country. And we got chosen as out of the 1500 companies as one of the top innovations, one of the top five innovations of the show. And that I think really helped as well as, you know, in my old product line, I formed a lot of great relationships. People loved the product. And there were actually a lot of stores like William Sonoma and like Cost Plus who loved the product and just said, oh, I love the product, I love you. I'm just not quite sure that this product is gonna make me money. And so when I was able to say, hey, I have this now, it was really easy to convert them. So I think that it was definitely building off of those relationships from the previous line um, and understanding how those sales channels worked and also uh, 
where to be something totally unique, you know, there isn't someone who's doing something just like us. And it, it's, it was very exciting for, for our first accounts. Yeah, that's amazing. Have you seen some fast copiers, um, copycats emerge or? <laughs> Not yet. I know they're coming. I, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen some, some, uh, <laughs> some things on the internet that are similar, but you know, we're, was it, you know, I think it's healthy. I think it's, it's good, good for us. More, more attention to the space for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So back to, so you went through 500 startups, you're going through demo day and then, you know, some of the names on uh, the round, like social starts. I mean, I've heard of some of these, maybe talk about actually uh, identifying startups that are identifying investors that would invest in this type of startup and, you know, talk about the process. How many did you talk to? Um, did you find a lead? All that good stuff. Yeah, so at 500, they really prepared you for the arduous task of fundraising and, and really taught me that it was a full-time job, that if you want to create a real market for your company, that you have to be fundraising full-time in order to start and close your round as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a really great lesson for me um, and for, to prepare me into going into it and to prepare my business for me to be uh, absorbed like that in the process. And the way that I found investors was a lot of trial and error because, you know, you, ha you basically try to find as many contacts as you can. I would say the biggest source of contacts was through other founders, especially founders who were probably one step ahead of you who had raised their seed round or their series A round. And, you know, if you look in your network and you, you'll, you'll be surprised at how many people you'll find, um, especially, uh, luckily, I, I had some really great people. And if they, they connect you to other founders, or you just meet people through your network at a founder events, and you're able to share leads, because, you know, my found, my investors tell me all the time that they're, that they would love recommendations from me. If it's at all within their scope, if I give them a recommendation, they'll likely take the pitch. Um, and so, but I also tried to target people too. So when I was first starting out, I would be looking for perhaps like companies that were similar to mine, but not, not, not a conflict of interest and looking at who invested in them. And I would work backwards. Right. Um, I did find that that was not actually as good of a strategy as you think it is because you have to make sure also that that company is doing well. That mm. is a big learning that I had. Right. Um, there was a coffee company that had gotten that had been fun that had received funding in the valley a few years before me which was a big inspiration for me i didn't think that they were that competitive with me and thought that maybe their investors would want to invest in me and when i approached them i learned quickly after having really sought after those leads that that company was actually not doing well and if anything this was such an absolute no-go because it was at all resembling so you want to find the yeah. thing that you want to be supported on the you want to have meetings where you're finding out kind of what the trends are in venture, what people are looking for, and you want to make sure that that's in line with how you want to raise and that you're looking at companies who have things in their portfolio where the learnings will be applicable to what you're trying to do. Yeah, no, those are good, good, uh, good nuggets of advice. How many investors do you think you talked to? And were you targeting food investors as well as obviously tech investors, subscription model investors, kind of all, all across the board? Great question. Um, I ended up not targeting food investors because I found that food investors were had really uh, strong retail focus and our whole plan was to was to move focus away from retail. We would, we would maintain the retail business. It, it's going to double this year, but instead of pouring our resources into tripling that, I would rather 10x direct to consumer is kind of the the idea of what we want to do. And so finding companies who did that since since you know e-commerce and food is so new, you know, people have just started to become comfortable with buying food online. So I found that companies who had invested in cosmetics and fashion companies that were and companies that were particularly around subscription model were much of a better fit for being in line with what the kind of mentorship I need to grow that area of my business. Yeah. And Oh, and for the, number, oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say for the number of investors that I talked to, 
I remember 500 telling me that I would have to have about a hundred meetings per million that I wanted to raise. And I found mm. that to be about accurate. So I probably had about uh, 200 meetings about three fourths or more of those were to actual VCs and about a fourth of those were the meetings that you take to get leads to VCs. What, what is that latter category? That's with other founders or something? Oh, like meeting, yeah, meeting with other founders, meeting with, uh, you know, at one point we were like looking at the angel route. So you're sometimes meeting bankers, you know, you're meeting advisors uh, or potential advisors. You're, you're trying to build that top funnel of, cause you know, finding an investor who has money and is looking for a company just like yours is and finding a needle in a haystack. So that's why you have to have so many meetings. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. Actually, believe it or not, no one's, I don't think, used that metaphor of finding a needle in the haystack, but that is <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. You know, what would you do differently if you all, if you went back to, to raise money for this again? Any like big lessons learned or, or mistakes made that you'd try not to repeat? The main thing that I would do differently is just have more confidence that I was going to close the round. I think that, you know, after you've built a company for almost two years in a bootstrap mentality, you're always kind of waiting for doomsday and you live in that, that mode and you're always expecting everything to go wrong. And I didn't prepare enough to close the money and prepare what life would be like after closing the money. For instance, you know, it took me, three months to close the 2 million. And I'm, it's about, it's been about three months since I closed it and I am still struggling to hire people. And I wish that I had started to have the hires that I wanted in place or lined up before I had gone to raise the money and had more confidence that, that that was going to happen. And I definitely will not make that mistake again, you know, and I think that's the only thing that I would have done truly differently um, as to, and because it was something, you know, I, I built this company up to, you know, a million in revenue, but with just myself and one employee. And, you know, there were a lot of investors who rightfully said, you know, are you going to be able to build a team? You know, and I, it was, and if I had, I think that I could have even been more successful at fundraising if I had been like, yeah, look at these three people. I, have you know, been working with them part time. And, you know, you know, even if it would have cost me a little bit of equity on the back end to have had people working like that for me, yeah. I think that it would have been worth it both in terms of ramping up really quickly right after closing, as well as having a stronger, stronger fundraising round. Yeah, interesting. Boy, that's, you know, but that's the challenge, right? You've got to, like you said, fundraising is a full time job. Recruiting is close to a full I would have job. had could have only done it before I started raising. There's no way I would have had more time during the round, but I could have I could have tried to have lined up people before I went out to raise. Mhm. Mm That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's a good little strategy. Um but 3 months is is relatively quick. I mean, I've heard stories of it lasting much longer. That's that's about a typical right. Yeah. So, that's not that's not too bad. Um very good. All right. Well, anything else, uh, any lessons, other lessons learned uh, or anything else we haven't covered that you'd like to share? Just things you've, you've learned along the way. I think just one thing that someone told me when I was first starting out that made it a lot easier to get through the beginning stages, which are the hardest, just like starting your company, the very first pieces are the hardest same with your fundraise because you have no idea what people are going to say you have you're still for the first time answering questions by the end it's like no one can ask me a question I hadn't already answered and it was a lot easier to get through it but someone told me that I shouldn't worry about the raise until I had gotten 50 no's five zero um, and that was or, an interesting five zero or one five sorry can you say that Five zero. Five zero. Then I no. should be projected fifty. Yeah, before I start to get worried, because it's it's really really hard to be so vulnerable and and bring your co company to people and have them look at it and have them tell you no, you know, and and you begin to realize that people are telling you no for all types of reasons, and you can you can see that looking backwards, but when you're first putting yourself out there, it's 
it's really excruciating. And so the idea, since I'm so goal oriented, it made it a lot easier to be like, okay, I need to cross off 50 no's as opposed to feeling like every meeting I was hoping for a yes. You know, um, I think it made it a lot easier when you begin to look at the math and you're like, if I have to have 200 meetings to get five yeses, I mean, you have to be prepared to hear no a lot, you know? Totally. Uh, yeah, I think. And did you get a yes within that 50 uh, no mark or did, did you have? <laughs> Just about. I would say that it was pretty accurate because the thing is, is that it's not that you get the yes, you get you like within probably like 25, the first about maybe I want to say my 20th meeting somewhere around there I had someone say I would like to learn more and that's when it starts to get exciting you know and mm -hmm. your confidence begins to build and you begin to understand uh, what kind of partner would be good for you yeah yeah that's great well you ended up with if uh, Crunchbase is correct four investors in the round or more than that social start Silverton um... CRCM amplify her and venture and amplify her ventures as well as ride ventures okay great did anyone re lead the round or was it like a party round how'd you do it a uh, silver tin partners led the round oh gotcha gotcha excellent all right well this is very interesting if people want to learn more it's simply copper cow coffee.com do i have it right yeah yes Perfect. And the only thing I would want to plug is that I'm very excited for our subscription. We have done a soft launch of it and have been pretty blown away by how many people are signing up for it already. And it's a great way to find out we're going to have a new flavor every month for you to be able to kind of be in the know with all the stuff that we're coming out with. So that would be the one thing I'd want to plug. What's the frequency and quantity or what are the tiers? Like uh, how many coffees a month are you getting uh 20 coffees a month and you can choose with or without the creamers we have coconut as well as dairy and then we you can it's it's meant to be a month supply of coffee but you can choose your frequency of 30 60 90 days gotcha excellent all right debbie this is really cool i want to check it out um i'll look online and see where i can get it around here in san francisco because it sounds good i got to Go back to my <laughs> Vietnamese coffee passion. Um, awesome. Thanks so much and good luck. And we'll catch you after you raise your, your massive unicorn valuation series B, okay? Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.